According to the late Pakistani writer and revolutionary activist Iqbal Ahmad, the Palestinian struggle for self-determination stares the emotions of the entire world, particularly the nations and societies of the formerly colonized world. Echoing the Palestinian-American scholar Edward Said, he explained this connection as due to the role of ideas and values of liberation, equality, and fraternity, and to the solidarity people feel with another people seeking a home, or for the right to live free from the terror of soldiers and settlers. But Ekbal Ahmed also argued that Palestine resonates for a deeper reason. For him, the question of Palestine reveals the convergence of the painful colonial past, the neo-colonial present, and the dangerous outlook for the future. Just when there was the dawn of decolonization in the third world in the mid 20th century, Palestine was returned to the earliest, most intense form of colonial menace, the exclusivist settler colonial project of Israel that expelled Palestinians from their homeland. The tragedy occurred as a counterpoint to contemporary history, a reminder that all was not well with the area of decolonization. Today, the past, present, and future of Palestine and the question of global solidarity remains as relevant and urgent as ever. So that's why it's called the Unity Intifada, because it represented this moment where Palestinians seem to be breaking through the shackles of their geographic fragmentation and isolation, and once again coming together as one people united in purpose. I think it also helps you to see how all these struggles are connected, not just in terms of, of shared values and principles, but also in terms of the oppressive systems that work against us. So there is this interconnected web of oppression. And I think that's why our resistance against, against it is also becoming more, more interconnected. So I've been Turk, and then I've been Latina, and then I have been uh, French, and I have been Spanish, and I have been Palestinian, and I have been Israeli. So I've had like, my face seems to speak different uh, languages to other people. So it's kind of an interesting reality of displacement. And the fact that other people look at us and try to uh, desperately locate us. Uh, put us in some box, uh, try to identify who we are to know if we are friend or foe. You know, somebody once told me, you know what you all are calling intersectionality today, we basically refer to as solidarity, right? Intersectionality is not, you know, it's not some visionary framework. It's actually quite fundamental and basic. And it's one that understands how various groups and identity groups are actually connected in joint struggle. Welcome to Security in Context, a podcast aimed at promoting new thinking on security from a global perspective. I'm your host, Anita Fuentes, and today's podcast will revolve around the Palestinian struggle for liberation from the perspective of solidarity movements. For this episode, I interviewed four Palestinian authors and scholars located in different parts of the world who spoke about social justice movements and identitary groups who have historically supported the Palestinian cause. They are Muin Rabani, an independent analyst specialized in Palestinian affairs and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Very nice to be with you. Noura Erekat, a human rights attorney and associate professor at Rutgers University. Thanks, Anna. I'm happy to be here. Lina Meruane, an author and professor at the Madrid branch of the New York University. Muchas gracias. And Yara Hawari, an academic, writer, and senior policy analyst at Al Shabaka. Thank you so much for having me. Our first guest is Muin Rabani, an independent analyst, contributing editor of the Middle East Report, and co editor of Jadaliya. Previously, he was a senior analyst and special advisor on Israel-Palestine with the International Crisis Group and head of political affairs with the Office of the United Nations Special Envoy for Syria. During our conversation, Muin walked me through the key political developments that, during the past decade, have shaped the landscape around the Palestinian struggle for self-determination. <laughs> 
These developments have taken place at various levels. The Palestinian level, the Israeli level, the regional level, and the international level. At a Palestinian level, there have been two main developments. The first major development is the increasing fragmentation of the Palestinian body politics. The first is the growing fragmentation of the Palestinian body politic, which refers to the continuing schism between Fatah and Hamas, a situation where you have one group that is ruling under Israeli occupation in the West Bank and another group that's ruling under Israeli occupation in the Gaza Strip. And in addition to that, you have growing geographical fragmentation of the Palestinians uh, between those in the West Bank, between those in the Gaza Strip, between those inside the Green Line, meaning the Palestinian community in Israel. Um, then you have the diaspora communities, primarily in uh, Jordan, Syria, uh, Lebanon. And, and what we've seen is during the past decade, uh, really for the first time in contemporary Palestinian political history, is that geography has become an important part of political activity. In other words, that what used to be a unified Palestinian people acting through national institutions, we've seen those national institutions disintegrate to an increasingly large degree. And Palestinians are now, or have been for much of the past decade, acting increasingly within the confines of these restricted geographical entities. The second major development at the Palestinian level is the collapse of the political legitimacy of the Palestinian Authority. So the Palestinian Authority is the administrative agency that was established pursuant to the um, uh, 1993 Oslo agreements to basically run the affairs of most Palestinians within the West Bank excluding East Jerusalem and, uh, and the Gaza Strip. And what I think was at least to me, clear from the beginning and had always been implicit and has become as clear as daylight during the past decade, is that the Palestinian Authority is essentially a subcontractor for the Israeli occupation. In other words, we have to view it as an extension of the Israeli occupation rather than an adversary of that occupation. And that becomes most evident in the field of um, security cooperation between the Palestinian security forces in the West Bank and the Israeli occupation army. And the, it's important if you recognize that the leadership of the PA is also for all intents and purposes, the leadership of the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, which has formed the core of the contemporary Palestinian national liberation movement, what we've seen is a very far-reaching and almost total collapse of its legitimacy and authority. And as a result of that, what we've had is um, a growing fragmentation of, of Palestinian political initiatives, usually by small groups, often uh, not organized. But there's been kind of this political ferment in, in Palestinian ranks. And so looking forward, it'll be very interesting to see whether these groups manage to effectively challenge and reform the Palestinian national movement in the name of the PLO, or whether they begin to, to set up perhaps alternative organizations and institutions, or whether they continue as they have been, kind of acting autonomously without any clear and coherent uh, political organization. That's the Palestinian dimension. At the Israeli level, says Muin, the main development during the past decade has been an increasingly pronounced rightward shift, not only of the Israeli political elite, but also of the Israeli society. If you compare, for example, 2022 to the late 1960s when the occupation first began, back then there was, uh, let's say to the extent that there was a fault line within Israeli politics concerning how to deal with the Palestinians and specifically the occupied territories, you had kind of one group that advocated a indefinite, meaning permanent, continuation of the status quo as the best vehicle to advance Israeli interests in the occupied territories and to keep kind of the Palestinians under their thumb versus another group that felt 
that the Palestinians could over time pose a significant challenge to Israel and that therefore there was a need for some kind of political resolution. Back then, they never really seriously considered the idea of engaging with the Palestinians and the PLO directly. And they were looking mainly at some kind of territorial dispensation where the West Bank would be divided between, for example, Israel and Jordan. But in the early 1990s, they engaged directly uh, with the PLO. And the idea was that ultimately there would be some kind of territorial dispensation, not where the Palestinians would recognize Israel within its 1948 boundaries and Israel would enable and recognize a Palestinian state throughout the occupied territories, but rather from the Israeli perspective, that there would be a partition of the West Bank between Israel and uh, the Palestinians. That's changed now. The fault line today in Israeli society is between those who continue to advocate a perpetual continuation of the status quo. In other words, you know, just keep doing what they're doing without either seeking to reach an agreement with the Palestinians or the surrounding Arab states, on the, and to continue, of course, with the settlement expansion and colonization of the West Bank. That on the one hand. And on the other hand, their main uh, rivals now are not those calling for political settlement, but those calling for the formal annexation of all of the West Bank. Uh, Most annexationists call for the annexation of most of the West Bank because, of course, their agenda is to incorporate the land, um, but not the people. You know, they don't want these Palestinians who live under their rule to become Israeli citizens. So they would leave kind of isolated Bantustan type islands within the West Bank. So what you would effectively get is rather than Israeli settlements within Palestinian territory, in their ideal, you would have Palestinians, Palestinian settlements within sovereign Israeli territory. And the other main dynamic, of course, is is the accelerating and expanding growth of the settlement enterprise, the colonization of uh, the West Bank. At the regional level, the Arab uprisings of the beginning of the last decade represent an unprecedented moment of political consciousness in action. On the regional level, um, quite clearly, the most important development during the past decade has been the Arab upheaval, where you've had you know, open warfare and, and civil conflicts or, or, or regional uh, conflicts in, in Syria, in Yemen, in Libya, uh, of course, in, uh, in Iraq. You have this um, uh, extraordinary regional polarization between one group of states, let's call them um, conservative um, absolutist monarchies uh, led by Saudi Arabia versus another uh, group that's often seen as being um, uh, led by Iran, but also includes a number of Arab states and political movements. And that has, of course, um, had a fundamental impact on on the Palestinians. The, the formal Arab state system has, to a large degree, decomposed and fallen apart. So that even kind of the pro forma support that Palestinians used to get from um, from Arab states has, to a significant extent, been replaced by either states seeking an informal or open alliance with Israel in order to preserve their own power or as an ally against the regional rivals. And the other, I think, important development at the regional level, if you, you've seen the uh, growing prominence of what are called non-state actors. As states have become weaker, and in some cases have lost their capacity to rule and govern or disintegrated outright, you've seen um, uh, the growth of political movements or militant movements playing an increasingly prominent role in the affairs, uh, affairs of the region. Finally, at the international level, a key development, according to Muin Rabani, has been the growing acquiescence and at times outright formal support for Israel's annexationist and expansionist policies by the West. Uh, here I'm thinking mainly of the United States during the Trump years, where it formally recognized Israel's claims of sovereignty over East Jerusalem, issued a diplomatic plan that explicitly called upon Israel to annex 
something like a third or more of the West Bank outright and so on. You know, people should have no illusions uh, about the United States. You know, Democrat, Republican, the U.S. has a institutional commitment to Israel and its policies, and Palestinians are not going to uh, get in the way of that, at least as far as the U.S. establishment and political elites are concerned. It's a bipartisan consensus. To give you an example, when Trump recognized Israel's claims of sovereignty over Jerusalem and moved the U.S. Embassy to Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and I won't get into the details and background and about how this was a direct violation of a U.N. Security Council resolution um, that had, in fact, passed with U.S. acquiescence. Um, the main complaint from Democrats was, or from, uh, I believe it was uh, Chuck Schumer, who was a leader of the Democrats in, in the Senate, was not that this was a travesty and was a violation of Palestinian rights and a violation of international law and so on. His main complaint was that he wasn't invited to the opening of the embassy to be able to participate in the festivities. So let's have no illusions um, about either what American policy is. Um, I, the U.S. should be seen as an adversary and should be treated like an adversary and should be confronted as an adversary. And that, I think, is the only way that there is a realistic prospect of changing U.S. policy towards the Palestinians. And the Europeans, who reign supreme when it comes to hypocrisy, uh, have, in effect, acquiesced um, to this agenda. And when I say they reign supreme when it comes to hypocrisy, you know, on the one hand, uh, they make these grandiose statements and so on, uh, but when push comes to shove, they're completely on side with Israel and in terms of opposing any form of Palestinian opposition to any Israeli policy. In 2021, Israel attempted to attack Palestinian families in a key neighborhood in East Jerusalem, just outside the old city, called Sheikh Jarrah. This initial attack then expanded into an attack on Palestinian Muslim worshippers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque and Haram al-Sharif, which dominate the skyline of the old city. During the previous years, Palestinians had effectively been abandoned by their own leadership, and they had been either passively or actively abandoned by the Arab states and governments. In some cases, due to these countries' own internal conflicts, but in other cases, because they were curting alliances and formal relations with Israel, turning the long-standing strategic equation that Arab normalization with Israel would be dependent on an Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories on its head. In this breeding ground, and after the 2021 attacks, Palestinians felt that they had reached a critical point. It was a do-or-die situation where they could either stand up and defend their most basic rights or they could be left with nothing to defend. They chose to rise up in what is known as the Unity Intifada. The Israeli attempt to attack Palestinian families in a um, key neighborhood in East Jerusalem just outside the Old City uh, which is called uh, Sheikh Jarrah, which I suspect uh, is a name that has become familiar to many of your listeners. That set in motion a process where you had the Palestinian community within Israel mobilized in support of the Palestinians in East Jerusalem. Then you had Hamas in the Gaza Strip firing rockets at Israel to demonstrate their solidarity with the Palestinians in East Jerusalem and as, as an act of opposition against the Israeli assault on Palestinian worshippers um, at uh, uh, the holiest uh, Muslim site in Palestine, and then an eruption of Palestinian protests throughout the West Bank. And what I think is, is so significant about what ended up being the unity uprising is, as, as I was saying previously, you've had this geographical fragmentation of Palestinians um, since Oslo, but particularly in the last decade, where kind of each geographic community has basically been limited to acting on the basis of interests that concern it directly within its own geographical limits. 
what you had here was quite different. You know, there have been several conflicts or several Israeli assaults on the Gaza Strip uh, since 2008. This was the first time that not only did Hamas initiate hostilities rather than Israel, but it initiated these hostilities for reasons that effectively had nothing to do with Israeli policy towards Hamas or towards the Gaza Strip, but it was because of what Israel was doing towards another Palestinian community. Um, and the same is true for the Palestinian community in Israel. And then before this outburst of, of demonstrations and so on ended, you had Palestinians throughout the diaspora also engaging in mass demonstrations, supported, I should add, by massive demonstrations in, in, in a number of Arab states and, and by their uh, supporters in many parts of the world. So that's why it's called the Unity Intifada, because it represented this moment where Palestinians seem to be breaking through the shackles of their geographic fragmentation and isolation, and once again, coming together as one people, um, united in purpose, and, and acting as a people rather than as kind of um, individual disjointed community. The unity uprising brought all the Palestinians together in an act of solidarity for the victims of the Israeli attacks in Sheikh Jarrah, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and Haram al-Sharif. Our next guest, Noura Erika, spoke to us about solidarity, not among the Palestinian people, but between black nationalist movements, third world anti-colonial movements, and the Palestinian liberation movement, and explained why racism and colonialism are considered by many African-American activists and organizations as co-constitutive systems of domination. Noura Erika is a human rights attorney and an associate professor at Rutgers University in the Department of Africana Studies and the Criminal Justice Program. Her research interests include human rights law, national security law, refugee law, social justice, and critical race theory. She is also a co-founding editor of Jadaliya and author of the book Justice for Some, Law and the Question of Palestine. So one of the things that I've been trying to think about is the relationship between racism and colonialism. Oftentimes, um, we find these systems are so intertwined, if we think about them as structures of domination, that are both meant to create a hierarchy amongst people that is based on a logic that suggests that there is otherness and that suggests that there is not only distinction, but distinction whereby there is some superior group that is entitled to domination, that is entitled to the accumulation of wealth, and another population that is entitled, you know, that is deserving of subjugation and also deserving of the extraction of wealth. And so, and, you know, these systems are quite large. And if you think of them very abstractly, they, they almost seem redundant. So, you know, m my kind of thinking was that I, where I get here and how I get to the idea of thinking about the relationship between them was thinking through um, Black Palestinian solidarity. And studying Black Palestinian solidarity, initially asking questions, what sutures this solidarity? What sutures these two communities? Why? What are the legacies of this kind of transnational solidarity? What? Is, how do you articulate joint struggle? And what I found in the course of that work and inquiry is that whereas we t tend to think, because as we say Black Palestinian, we tend to think of this as a as a framework around two identity. Um, groups and, and thus contingent on identity politics. In fact, what I found that um, Black Palestinian solidarity functions as an anti-imperialist analytic. So it's a particular politics that sees racism and colonialism as structures that are, are quite enti uh, entwined and reaffirming. And so what does that help us do? It helps us, for example, to be able to uh, pull out in the context of Palestine the racist nature of Israeli domination, of Zionist apartheid, right? What, what does that look like? How do we think, how does this offer us a racial analytic, not only um, to understand settler colonial removal, 
but a particular kind of, of, of logic that justifies that removal and that makes rational this kind of uh, violence that's meted against Palestinians on a daily basis. Now, refracted back, how does that help us in the case of understanding the condition of Black communities in the United States? Well, so often we're quick to understand that it's racism, obviously, but what Black Palestinian solidarity as an analytic would help us do is to illuminate how the United States remains, continues to be, and remains a white colony. And the subjugation of Black peoples is also a form of colonial subjugation, whereby the force that's used against them is, is one that represents, right, that, that the police is not there in order to maintain order, but the police is there, right, as, as an enemy force in their communities that poses a threat, that is policing them in order to protect others, who do belong in the nation, and then also um, one that has subject them to segregation, ghettoization, um, conditions um, of, of uh, premature death, and all of this, right, all of this is extracted from the Black radical tradition, which has understood the Black condition in North America as a colonial one and not merely a racist one in an imperfect democracy, but as a colonial one uh, whereby, you know, Black people, in order to be free, must not only democratize the United States, but must actually decolonize um, the United States. I also think Black Palestinian solidarity does a disservice to the history of transnational solidarity, which far exceeded these two groups, but in fact represented um, a third world revolt, a solidarity amongst the non-aligned movement, amongst the group of 77, amongst a group of, you know, that of what springs from the Bandung conference and the spirit of Bandung um, amongst, you know, post-colonial and colonized peoples who are basically um, seeking to append imperial domination and to create an alternative system whereby decolonization and national independence is just the predicate element in, you know, on that pathway um, to liberation, right? It seems like a, a quite a short-circuited um, and unfinished an unfinished project, um, so to speak. And so I think better ways that I've come to understand it are offerings from scholars like Russell Rickford, who reminds us of Black transnationalism, whereby Palestine fits as one data point, right, as one coordinate in a very broad spectrum of, of what Black internationalists are doing. They conceive of themselves as a colony within the within the first world whose fate is connected to the colored peoples of the world who is connect you know they're connected to to china connected to cuba connected to other um african peoples on the continent connected to algerians to palestinians connected to uh, um a, a broad network of peoples who are struggling against imperialism whereby the us becomes another site of it, and they become um, right. They become a colony within within the first world, and that complicates also how to think about decolonization because it's not necessarily territorial. But at the same time, if we do want to insist upon a territorial element, you can make that argument given um, what Black internationalists offered us in terms of the Black Belt thesis. Um, in terms of similar with Palestinians who have also historically exercised exercised a legacy of transnationalism that was in no way, you know, by no means simply limited to, for example, the relationship with the SNCC or the relationship with the Black Panther Party in um, the United States, but as we know, extended to um, personally to Nelson Mandela, the African national um, Congress that extended to the Viet Cong, that extended to all colonized peoples. When Yasser Arafat delivers his infamous um, speech uh, from the UN podium in 1974, which basically marks the entrance of the PLO into the UN foray, he begins that speech by basically congratulating all newly liberated peoples who had who had achieved liberation in 1974. This is when the non-aligned movement has achieved automatic majority within the General Assembly and are entering that space as a site of struggle where they're changing even the international rules in order to advance their cause 
of, of collective uh, liberation. And so uh, this history doesn't necessarily, I wouldn't say, um, you know, so many people try to trace it. What's the point at which it begins? I know there has been so much sensitivity. There's renewals that we experience in 2014 during the Gaza Ferguson, what's known as the Gaza Ferguson moment, when there is the simultaneous occupation of uh, Ferguson by U.S. National Guard and police, as well as the simul and the bombardment, the 51-day bombardment of the besieged population of Gaza. In that moment, what, there was a, 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 a renewal of Black Palestinian solidarity that you know brought it was almost like an analytical return to this um, analytic and one that I find was sutured through um, a structure of intimacy and relationships between peoples, you know, even peoples who didn't have, you know, who might have even been Black internationalists, but thought that their solidarity should have been extended to other, you know, Afro-descendant populations like in Brazil. Um, and so even had hesitancy to uh, um, align themselves with Palestinian. But what happens on the streets of Ferguson is that Palestinians are there. They show up. They choose to be on the Black side of the color line um, in a way that uh, reignites, catalyzes the, these these relationships and this analytic, which has had uh, since then an, a, a very robust afterlife. And so we start drawing these connections then to also understand, as one responded in my interview said to me, Rachel Gilmer, a member and leader of the Dream Defenders, that during the Ferguson occupation, what became illuminated is that the same weapons that were being used against Palestinians were being used against, you know, black people in the United States, that this is this is the military industrial complex. Right. This is about the subjugation of brown and black bodies. So here, you know, what what really gets illuminated in thinking about intersectionality is one, a leftist politics that understands um, the role of of um, materialism and understanding um, the conditions under which we live, and also understands um, a colonial condition that is that is racist and a racist condition that is colonial in 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 these situations at least that I mention. So it enables us to it enables us to get past the past the particularities of the differences that are quite significant, right? Black people have 400 years of chattel slavery and, you know, overcoming it that Palestinians do not know. The Palestinian struggle is much, you know, much more recent. It's only 100 years, 100 and some years, right? So it's not, it's it's ways that we get past needing to understand struggles as connected by sameness, because that's not the point. Instead, it helps us understand what are the conditions, right? What are the same technologies of repression and the same structures of oppression that we are all struggling against together. U.S. institutions have historically attempted to quote-unquote discipline those standing up for Palestinian liberation. I asked Noura about the response of the U.S. government, institutions, and media with regard to the actions carried out by Black internationalists in support of Palestine. Here is what she said. That's a great question because actually in, you know, in the historical, especially in the United States, the history of support and solidarity with Palestinians, punishment for that support has has been meted out largely um, to black radicals. And specifically because black radicals in the United States are not merely seen as dissidents, right? You can you can discipline a dissident who has the right to free speech, but the black radical and black protest is seen as as insurgency, right? This is a threat to the entire nation. In fact, black radicals historically were um, who, uh, you know, charged the U.S. with genocide. For example, in 1951, like Paul Robeson, were accused of, of being in alignment with the Communist Party so that even their protest of using an internationalist framework to, you know, protest the U U.S., treatment of black people could was not even taken you know at face value but instead reframed as being a conduit for a foreign and external threat right it's that threat 
It's that threat whereby the black body is already seen as external, is already seen as colonized. And then the protest, and you know, in the words of James Baldwin, even the protest of a black child is seen as a threat because it's an, it's this insurgency that that then meets out this this greatest punishment to them. And so we see that over and over again. Uh, Paul Robeson is an example. Even Angela Davis, who has now, you know, after overcoming a trial that would have, you know, set her to the death penalty three times over, right? And overcoming that trial and becoming more or less an icon in the U.S. and a very accomplished scholar. Recently, I think it was in 2018, had a civil rights award that was given to her in her hometown of Birmingham, right? That that civil rights award was revoked. Obviously, protest um, in response to that she received it anyway. Mark Lamont Hill is another example. When he, on the International Day of Solidarity, expresses solidarity with Palestinians and at the end says something that's quite defensible when he says, you know, Palestinians will be free from the river to the sea, that was construed to mean excluding Jews and thereby uh, Jewish Israelis and thereby, you know, subjecting them to removal, was then immediately fired from CNN, where he was a commentator, and also faced threats of the revocation of his tenure um, at Temple. So these are the... But, I mean, I I say all this, but I want to emphasize that the greatest punishment for this work is, is reserved for Palestinians themselves, is reserved for the likes of Rasmiya Odeh, who had been in the United States for 20 years, had built an institution, um, you know, institutions in Chicago, including an Arab women's empowerment program that, you know, she single-handedly recruited 800 Arab women in the Chicago area um, to empower them with job training, right, language classes, community development, you know, even work of, of how to get out of violent situations, she had her citizenship revoked after, you know, the FBI tried and failed to punish other activists in the region. Or Stephen Salaita, who really nobody had ever had their tenure revoked. Stephen Salaita had his tenure revoked. Many had had their tenure denied, but he had his tenure revoked um, because of his tweets that would otherwise be defensible under, you know, free speech or maybe a, a, a disciplinary hearing, but to have tenure revoked and now not even being a part of the academy to be driven out of other sides of the academy. I mean, this is the punishment we're talking about. Or Samuel Arian, who is a major organizer in South Florida, you know, is actually swung the Muslim vote in Florida for the Bush um, administration and is later held for years on um, secret evidence, prosecuted under... Uh, material support, um, in prison, put in solitary confinement, you know, thanks be he's finally released and he's now abroad, but he had to leave the United States, right? These punishment, the LA-8, <laughs> I laugh, but the LA-8, I mean, is, is, a, is a group of seven Palestinians and one Kenyan who are basically subject to a witch hunt between late, I think, 1987 through 2007, all because of their political activity and some affiliation with the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. I I think one way to think about it is that the repression of Palestinian activists and activism is um, a guinea pig for U.S. repression of all groups. Because often, most people, either because of the exception on Palestine, the progressive exception on Palestine, or a fundamental lack of understanding of the Palestinian struggle as a freedom struggle, Don't pay a lot of attention to when Palestinian activists are punished, right? They explain that away in their heads. They deserved it somehow, or it's it's tied up in a security question somehow. Um, And it's that it's that turning away, it's that assumption and lack of concern, uh, which makes the repression of Palestinian activism historically so effective, and what has you know, in practice, become an incubator for the means and methods of repression that are applied to all groups. I also had the pleasure to talk to Lina Meruane, an awarded writer and a professor of Latin American cultures at the NYU branch in Madrid, Spain. 
Her novels, written in Spanish, have been widely acclaimed and translated to many languages. However, our conversation revolved around her non-fictional work. In particular, her collection of essays titled "Palestina en Pedazos," where she explores her mixed identity as a Latin American, as a Chilean, and as a Palestinian woman. I was actually raised as a Chilean, una chilena común y corriente. Uh, this is what I talk about in my book, how I come from a Palestinian family on my father's side. My grandparents migrated at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, which is basically a century ago. And although I have those roots because of the imposition of assimilation, meaning losing the language and adapting to the rules of the land, in this case, Chilean land. My father and my aunts grew up as Chileans, uh, did not learn the language, and I did not either, and my brothers didn't. So losing the language means also sort of losing a very tight connection to the Arabic world. And I grew up, again, as a Chilean, although knowing as a sort of rumor in the background that I also had origins there. On my mother's side, the origin is Italian, so it's already very mixed. And uh, so I didn't really have a connection, a very strong connection, but I also migrated to New York later in life. And I have been writing about displacement because I come from a displaced family and I also am a displaced person. And also I'm very aware of exile uh, happening in Chile during the dictatorship. So this is a, a question that I had. And I suddenly thought that maybe I could write something about... Originally, I did not have a plan of writing about Palestine. I was just going to travel there, visit a couple of friends, see the land. It was a sort of more naive idea of what that travel would mean to me. But the experience of trying to get into the land and being recognized as a Palestinian and being uh, subjected to many hours in the small room of the immigrants and being questioned over and over again and the sort of humiliation that I felt and the anger that this created made me write. Um, I am often somebody who writes when I need to get something out of my system, so to speak. And so I started writing actually as soon as I got on that plane that would take me to Palestine. And I did not stop really in 10 years. So the first part of the book that I've written, which is called Palestina in Pedazos, like Palestine in Pieces, which is the latest edition of this book, the first part that I wrote was an essay called Becoming Palestine, Volverse Palestina. And that is sort of the account of that first trip that has to do with being there, talking to people, and then trying to figure out why I did not know much about my own Palestinian upbringing. So there's also a trip down to Chile to talk to my father, to talk to my aunts, and of course, some research that I that I did back in the day. This is 2012. So that's that was the beginning of my book. But then I also realized that there was much more to learn because just being a witness of experience in a place doesn't give you a full picture. So I felt that I didn't really own the historical um narrative and that I really needed to study more and do research. So this is when I actually took a full year to research on the history, but not only on the history, but the language that people have used to talk about Palestine, the erasures that have been um, done uh, in terms of language and in terms of reality, the ways in which uh, both uh, Palestinian uh, U.S., and Israeli intellectuals and writers and historians uh, have recounted that story and so on and so forth. And I really discovered that language was another battlefield. Uh, as much as the geography itself, language is a territory to be contested. And the ways in which we speak, right, uh, locate us on one side or the other and make us accomplices uh, of the Israeli official language or uh, make us sort of more prone to the cause of the Palestinians themselves. So that was the second part. It's called uh, Becoming Others, Volvernos Otros, 
And then some years later, I actually returned to Palestine on a different trip, a trip that uh, uh, began uh, in, in actually Berlin in Germany. And it is a sort of a real return uh, to the land. The first was a trip. The second was, a, in fact, a real return for me. And so I uh, wrote about identity and identity politics and facial recognition uh, and really sort of connected to the fact that I look Palestinian to some people and look Jewish to others and then look all sorts of ways to other people as well. And I thought that that was a super interesting problem, right, in terms of where you belong to and when, where people assign you to. I asked Lena about solidarity ties between Chile and Palestine, about the Chilestinian community, and about South-South solidarity. Here is what she told me. Well, I think it's important to say here that Chile has the largest Palestinian community outside of the Arab world. It's very hard to count, of course, because it's an old community, a century-old community that keeps on arriving, uh, a community that is mostly Christian, but not only, um, and a community that uh, married uh, outside of the community. So it's not only the, the sort of the pure Palestinians, so to speak, but it's also people that married into other families. And so I am a half Palestinian, but then there's plenty of people who are a quarter Palestinian. And because it's a very integrated and loved community, um, people are very interested in the Palestinian uh, conflict. And uh, so when the that conflict has uh, been heated up by actual sort of um, bombings uh, and uh, and violence. Uh, I would say that a majority of the Chilean community has responded in defense of Palestine, which is, I think, very, very, uh, very beautiful as well, right? And it is because there is a recognition of the colonial status of Palestine today and its apartheid. So people in Chile, I would say, generally speaking, and this is, of course, generalization, are well informed and uh, moved by the Palestinian situation. So that would be speaking of a sort of larger community. Then the smaller community, the, the actual Palestinians, uh, have plenty of associations uh, since uh, the beginning of their migration to Chile. So they were there were early... Uh, newspapers in Arabic, then newspapers in um, in Spanish as well, or sometimes bilingual. There is uh, social clubs. There is the um, um, a soccer club as well called Palestino, right? Where you know during the games they all have also their own stadium, right? And they, during the games they show the Palestinian flag, which is something that cannot be done in Palestine. So there is a huge awareness through many different venues, right? The, the soccer club, the social club, and many of the uh, many literary and political figures and artistic figures are also uh, carry Palestinian last names. So there is a, a, a big awareness. And I also would like to add that uh, there are uh, groups of Palestinians who actually send money to Palestine. Uh, this is why when I traveled to Palestine, I was immediately recognized not only as Chilean, but carrying a uh, Palestine or Arabic sounding last name. And immediately I had sort of difficulties and a lot of questions to answer. But I think Chile in particular is a very aware country of its Palestinian uh, community, very large and beloved community. And I think the same thing can be said, for example, of Honduras, which has the largest proportion of its population uh, originating in Palestine. But then, of course, Palestinians are all over, as well as all other Arabs who came um uh, in that early migration from uh, Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and so forth. The concept of Global South can be complicated uh, when we think about Southern America, uh, just because it's really not a location, but sort of a reality that some people live through. So in each of our Latin American countries, we could say that there is a part that is more connected to the North, uh, than to the South, if, if we think about sort of those two concepts, right? And it has to do with wealth. It has to do with class. 
it has to do with race. It even has to do with gender sometimes. So it's not that ent the entirety of Chile is part of the global South. We need to sort of also think about the uh, class, racial, gender distinctions amongst us. And what is actually very interesting to note is that part of that Chilestinian uh, community is actually wealthy in Chile. Uh, and not only wealthy, but sort of... Uh, Uh, educated, knowledgeable, and sometimes doesn't see, part of that community doesn't see itself necessarily as being part of a global South and is much more allied to the to some of the global North politics than to the global South politics, right? Because we also do identify global South as sort of being more left Uh, oriented, right? And the community, the Palestinian community in Chile is actually quite divided also on ideological terms. And during the Chilean dictatorship, that community was actually very divided. Some of that community, especially the wealthier part, uh, uh, were in favor of the right-wing dictatorship and the other part was actually not, was against it. So I think we need to be careful when we apply these concepts too generally. I also wanted to add to that, that um, that distinction and that separation had a lot to do with Palestine itself, because Yasser Arafat and the, o, and the OLP, as we say in, in Spanish, la OLP, which would be the PLO in English, was also left-wing inclined, right? And that created some internal tensions in the Palestinian community in Chile, Uh, in particular, when the PLO sent some representatives uh, to talk to Chileans uh, back in the day. So I think that all of these things sort of really complicated the figure of um, where people felt inclined uh, to, um, to support, right? where they felt connected to, ideologically speaking. Uh, what really changed, and interestingly, Uh, the moment that really sort of put the community a little bit back together was when the Sabra and Shatila massacre occurred in the Palestinian uh, refugee camps in the south of Lebanon. That was 1982. And, the, and this is sort of in the middle of dictatorship in Chile. So the community is very divided. Then this attack happens to the Uh, refugee camps in the south of Lebanon, and the community realizes that we are under attack in Lebanon, right? Um, and that really reunites the community and sort of rebuilds those ties that had been broken. But what I want to say is that that community is not homogeneous in itself. It's an old community. Ideologically, it's it's divided. And there's been times where they feel more connected and less. But that entire community wouldn't necessarily be represented by the word or the concept of Global South. Our last guest is Yara Hawari an academic whose research focuses on oral history projects and memory politics, and a policy analyst and podcast host at Al Shabaka, as well as the author of the book The Stone House, a tale of intergenerational trauma and survival under Israeli occupation. Yara has written and spoken extensively about the Palestinian struggle for liberation from Israeli settler colonialism. And she has also been outspoken about women's issues and gender equality. In 2019, in fact, she published the article The Political Marginalization of Palestinian Women in the West Bank, in which she highlights both the political role of Palestinian women in Palestine's struggle for freedom and the mechanisms through which women's political roles have been weakened, both within the Palestinian and the international community. I'd like to start out by saying that Palestinian women have uh, have long been uh, part of the Palestinian struggle for liberation or have always been part of the Palestinian struggle for for liberation. And they've always been uh, highly politicized individuals, not just, you know, as, as people defined by their relationship to men. Um, and they've always been there at crucial moments, um, crucial political and national moments. Uh, and they've always had to navigate as well tensions of feminism and nationalism and anti-colonial struggle and it hasn't always been easy uh, and Palestinian women haven't always uh, been successful in navigating those tensions. I think you know 
if we were to go back in history, I think one of the, the really key moments in, in history for Palestinian women participation uh, in resistance would be during the 1936 uprising against the British, um, in which Palestinian women not only participated in demonstrations en masse, but were also part of smuggling operations, uh, delivering weapons and supplies to guerrilla fighters. And, and it's important here to note as well that actually it was the rural and working class women that played the most vital role. Some examples include hiding guns in, in clothing or in the field, uh, collecting important information on, on British troop locations and supply routes, etc. Um, so that was really one of, uh, I think, the most important moments in, in, in Palestinian uh, resistance, but also in terms of uh, Palestinian women participation. Now, following the, the establishment of the, the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, in 1964, things be became much more institutionalised in terms of organisations and movements. And this was also the case for, for women's groups. Um, and something called the General Union of Palestinian Women was established. And this brought many different groups and organisations under its umbrella and it essentially revived uh, the Palestinian women's movement that had really since the ethnic cleansing in 1948 uh, suffered a very devastating blow. And, and this Union of Palestinian Women um, conducted all kinds of different activities, and including, you know, educational, medical, legal, social, vocational. Um, they created um, links with other women's organisations um, around the world. Now, unfortunately, since it, it's been dominated by the main Palestinian political party, Fatah, so it's taken on a very partisan colouring. Uh, around a decade later, uh, Palestinian women were in the 70s were also taking part in, in the armed struggle. And a particularly well-known revolutionary was Leila Khaled, a member of the leftist uh, Palestinian Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the PFLP. And she captured international attention for her role as a commander of the Dawson's Field Operation, which actually made her the first woman to hijack an airplane. And she went on to become a, a speaker in the international solidarity scene. And this armed resistance, I think, helped change a lot of traditional assumptions that, that, that people uh, had about gender roles. And I think it really challenged some of these uh, assumptions about feminism and, and nationalism. And I think the first intifada went on to, 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 to do that as well. And, you know, we saw images during the first intifada of women and, and girls very much taking up the, the, the resistance struggle, throwing stones against uh, Israeli soldiers and leading marches. And I think at this moment, women were really, Palestinian women were really solidifying their, their involvement in political organizing. But I think it's also important not to romanticize all these moments in history because I can't even imagine what a struggle uh, it was. And it can, you know, it continues to be a struggle uh, for women to, to find their place in these. Uh, in these spaces. I think, unfortunately, since the first and further, we have seen the space for women, uh, Palestinian women in resistance and in the, the political arena decrease. I asked Yara to go deeper into the causes of Palestinian women's political marginalization. She told me that the main force oppressing Palestinian women is, of course, the Israeli regime. But she emphasized the importance of also recognizing other oppressing forces, including the international community and the Palestinian authorities, which are not exempt of sexism. So I think the, over, the overarching forces um, that, that oppress Palestinian women uh, is, of course, the, the Israeli regime since the day it was established and even before. Uh, and they do this through all forms of gendered uh, violence, um, as well as empowering uh, patriarchal structures through relentless colonization, fragmentation of land and, and communities. But they specifically go after women who are particularly who are particularly politically active. Um, and the targeting, you know, can take place takes place in many different ways. It can include harassment. It can include threats of sexual violence, imprisonment. Palestinian uh, female political leaders have been consistently 
imprisoned by the the Israeli regime. To give you a, a more uh, tangible example, you know, during imprisonment, Palestinian women are often subjected to to very harsh forms of gendered violence in in attempt to break them. The interrogation often involves uh, threats of sexual violence. Often there are unnecessary uh, strip searches. Um, prison authorities have been known to deny women sanitary t- towels to restrict their access to bathrooms while they're menstruating. They've been uh, subjected to, to verbal sexual harassment, all kinds of things um, that essentially aim to weaponize their, their bodies against them. And this isn't something that's new. As I said, this has been happening uh, for decades, and it's also not something that's particularly unique to the to the Israeli regime. In fact, women world over faces these nasty, uh, very nasty types of gender tactics. But it's also important to recognize, of course, that Palestinian women also face a lot of challenges from 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 other areas, including the the international community and including the the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority actually adopts many of the the uh, violent gender practices that the the Israeli regime carries out. So, for example, demonstrations and protests um, have often been the sites of gendered violence, where PA security forces, um, you know, ver- will verbally uh, sexually harass uh, women, sometimes even physically. So, um, women are shamed. Uh, they draw in notions of honor and shame uh, and use them against them and against their families. More recently, there have been cases where women have had their phones stolen at demonstrations and private and personal messages or photos have been leaked on social media. You know, and there are there are cases of more uh, severe physical sexual harassment, of course. And and all of this is part of a, you know, uh, or an attempt to, to push spa- uh, to push women out of these political spaces uh, and to, to, to push them out of the, the political arena. Now with the, the international community, it's a, the marginalization of women and the barriers that they face is, is from the international community takes on a slightly different form. The international community plays a big role in Palestinian civil society. Uh, they uh, provide much of the funding uh, and the resources for Palestinian civil society, particularly since the Oslo Accords in the, the early 1990s. And what we've seen happen since then is a process called by scholars uh, NGOization of Palestinian civil society. Um, so this means that you know Palestinian civil society has become very focused on project deadlines, on budgets, on funding proposals, on annual reports, all of which are sort of geared towards a donor agenda and answerable to the international donor community. And inevitably, this has led uh, a shift to a shift in Palestinian civil society where uh, there is an increasing distance now between these organisations and and the grassroots. And it's had an effect on on the lexicon. So we used to have a very politicized civil society. Um, and since the enjoyization of the civil society, that has been watered down. And we can see this this change or the shift across civil society, but also within women's uh, groups and movements. You know, there are so many terms of buzzwords now that are used in, in different organizations that are obviously incredibly foreign or have been defined by you know UN agencies or other international organizations and they of course place their own meanings and conditions upon them so for example when we see in these international organizations or Palestinian organizations using the term women empowerment it's it's often limited to social economic empowerment and you know participation in decision making rather than empowering women Palestinian women to resist the colonial occupation And a lot of these projects actually end up focusing on helping women become financially less dependent on male breadwinners rather than um, um, helping women resist colonization. Um, So it's really, for Palestinian women, it's really coming at them from many many different angles, the marginalization and the uh, the oppression. Um, And I think that's what makes it even more remarkable when we see Palestinian women Uh, forcing their way through into these spaces. My last question for Yara Hawari had to do again with solidarity. 
More specifically, I asked her if this political marginalization to which Palestinian women have been subjected could be overcome through building solidarities with other women's movements in the Arab region and beyond. Palestinian women have uh, long maintained ties uh, with women uh, in the region, you know, in Algeria and Egypt and uh, in Syria and beyond. And and as I said, it's you know it's out of sort of shared struggle uh, against similar sort of mechanisms of patriarchy, out of shared understanding what it means to be an Arab woman. And I think in this day and age where interconnectedness is is made even easier, um, I think those those links are are once again being revitalized and i think it's it's important that they are because this is a shared struggle you know the struggle of palestinian women uh, and palestine um, isn't an insular struggle it's not something that's going to happen in a void but it's you know palestinian liberation and the liberation of palestinian women is going to come with seismic shifts across the region and across the world for that matter and so that's why these these solidarities and these shared struggles um, become even more important. And I think there is, from the West at least, a tendency to view feminism in a particular way. And there is a very homogenistic understanding of of what feminism should be. And that has long been imposed on not just Arab women and Palestinian women, but women in the global South. Um, and a limited understanding of context of colonialism, settler colonialism, uh, neo-colonialism, um, because for a large extent, white women have not experienced that. And so I think it's a natural um, thing for, for women in this region to sort of seek out familiarity and solidarity with others who who know what they've um, been or can, can empathise with what they've been struggling against. But I think, you know, unfortunately has also been a tendency to, to fetishize and orientalize the Palestinian struggle. And I think uh, feminists in the West have also been been guilty of that, you know, re- reproducing notions of, of Palestinian women as sort of, as docile, as passive, and, and of, ma- of Palestinian men as these overtly, you know, masculine heroes. And we have many of those elements within our own society, and so this is not to avoid uh, self-critique at all. Um, but unfortunately, you know, we saw that very well when a new Palestinian feminist movement sprung up uh, several years back called Talat, and the attention it got from uh, feminists in the West was was incredibly, you know, overwhelming. But it was a fetishization, I think, more than a... Uh, in many cases, it was a fetishization more than sort of legitimate solidarity, uh, excitement that, you know, these women might be throwing off their veils and embracing sort of Western womanhood. Uh, and unfortunately, that continues to be a very prevailing theme. And in a place like Palestine, where there is a high presence of of internationals and uh, NGOs and uh, and sort of, you know, international projects, especially when it comes to women, this this white feminism is really uh, seeping its way in here, and it has a very uh, destructive nature. We have to be clear that there are different uh, strands of feminist ideology. There is liberal feminism, uh, there's radical feminism, there's black feminism, and of course, you know, there are the with you know the, there are certain strands that are more in tune with the Palestinian struggle, more ideologically in tune with the Palestinian struggle and you know radical feminists and black feminists have long supported Palestinian liberation and Palestinian and the struggle of Palestinian women in in a very holistic manner much more uh, than uh, liberal feminists indeed like I think the discourse of Palestinian liberation doesn't fit within the agenda of liberal feminism uh, that well and of course when I'm talking about uh, black feminists and it's a it's a big generalization, but I'm thinking in particular of uh, uh, black feminists in the U.S. who have long been outspoken about Palestine, including uh, Angela Davis uh, and much of her cohort. Um, and and those are sort of those uh, those strands of feminism are inherently about internationalism uh, and about inter- intersectional struggle. Um, and so I think. You know those strands of feminism. It's it's only natural for them to support Palestinian liberation and and vice versa. You were just listening to Muin Rabani, Nora Arakat, 
Lina Meruane, and Yara Hawari. Thank you for listening to the Security in Context podcast. Security in Context is a transnational research initiative focusing on peace, conflict, and international affairs. Our goal is to critically examine paradigms and practices of security and produce alternatives based on collaborative research. If you want to keep up to date with our latest news, publications, and events, you can follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. For more information about the Security in Context Media Roundup, check out our website. We'll be back with more news updates in the next episode of Security in Context. Until then, stay tuned.